Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator. Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of writers and readers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. Um, I'm very thrilled today to welcome Jared Shanahan for the release of his new book, Captives, How Rikers Island Took New York City Hostage, out now from Verso Books. And we are joined in conversation by Jean-Darc Gorty. Uh, now to some housekeeping before I introduce our guests, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click on the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. We have a great lineup of events planned for you this spring and summer. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net. Sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out in particular is next Wednesday, May 25th. We're very thrilled to welcome Sarah Schulman for an in-person event in our store here in Brooklyn, celebrating the paperback launch of her political history of New York during the AIDS epidemic, Let the Record Show. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we will get started. Jared Shanahan is a writer, activist, and educator based in Chicago. He works as an assistant professor of criminal justice at Governor State University in University Park, Illinois, and is the co-author of States of Incarceration, Rebellion, Reform, and the Future of America's Punishment System, a co-editor of Treason to Whiteness is Loyalty to Humanity, a Noel Ignatieff reader, and an editor of Hardcrackers, Chronicles of Everyday Life. And Jandar Kakurti is an assistant professor of criminal justice and criminology at Loyola University in Chicago and is the co-author of States of Incarceration with Jared, uh, Rebellion Reform and the Future of America's Punishment System. I will have a link to buy that to pre-order that book as well. So without any further ado, I will leave the screen to you two. Jared, Jean Darka, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Noah, um, and the community bookstore for having us. Um, really happy to be here with Jared. Um, Jared is a really good uh, friend of mine, a dear colleague. Uh, we have written together. Ironically, we met in New York City through various um, political organizing uh, campaigns. So it's really nice to be back in New York, albeit, albeit virtually, <laughs> to have this conversation and to congratulate Jared um, May 17th really being the release date of captives. Um, so before um, we get into it, I just wanna say a little bit about the book. Um, you know, Rikers Island, as we know, is a huge jail complex, is the second largest in the country, uh, a sprawling jail, jail complex, which we'll be learning more about today. However, there is nothing um, written really on Rikers Island. So uh, Jared's book is really the, the definitive history of Rikers Island. And um, as we're going to talk about today, what I really appreciate about it is, is told through the story and the changing transformations of New York City life and politics. Um, but it is really kind of this definitive history of America's most notorious jail. And of course, the violent rise of New York City's law and order movement. So I'm just gonna read an excerpt from the jacket before we get into it today. Um, so Captives combines a thrilling account of Rikers Island's descent into infamy with a dramatic retelling of the last 70 years of New York politics from the vantage point of the city's jails. It is a story of a crowded field of contending powers, city bureaucrats and unions, black power activists, crooked cops and elected leaders, all struggling for power and influence, a tale culminating in mass incarceration and the triumph of neoliberalism. It is a riveting chronicle of how Rikers Island of today and the social rep order it represents came to be. So of course, a lot to unpack today, so let's get to it. So first I wanna welcome Jared and say, Jared, can you please hold a copy of your excellent book for the audience? Awesome, thank you so much. So I guess something that I was thinking about um, in terms of starting our conversation, I was really struck by the title of the book, um, Captives, How Rikers Island Took New York City Hostage, and also that photograph on the cover of the book. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the title of the book, the photograph, how it captures a bit of the book and what led you to write it. 
Thanks. Um, well, first of all, thank you uh, to Community Bookstore. Like Jana said, this is um, the, the day of the book's release. It's been a long time coming. I'm really excited. And Jana, we've been doing this for a long time. I cannot think of anyone who I'd rather uh, commemorate this day with. So thank you so much for doing this with me. Um, okay, enough with, this, with the mushy stuff. Um, the title comes from the social fact that in the present Rikers Island dominates the, the landscape of New York City politics and social life. Um, and from a historical perspective, I think it's very important to emphasize that this wasn't always the case, right? So Jana and I are both uh, professors of so-called criminal justice. And speaking only for myself, one of the major tasks that we face in teaching young people about the punishment system is denaturalizing it, um, is making them realize that we haven't always done things this way as a society. Uh, police haven't always managed social life. Uh, we haven't always had prisons, right? And in the very specific case of New York, we haven't always had Rikers Island. Um, so this is a story of how it came to be that a small uh, sliver of land in the East River came to play such an outsized role in the social life of America's largest city. Um, and so, I attempted to tell the story of how the foundation was laid. And like a lot of recent histories that I'm thinking about, um, Naomi, Mur Naomi Murakawa's The First Civil Right, um, Elizabeth Hinton's From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, right? I emphasize that this foundation was not laid by the law and order movement and the, the right wingers and the Republicans and the you know, the folks who it's pretty easy for us in certain circles to beat up on and blame all of our problems on. Um, I emphasize instead how the, the most fundamental infrastructure uh, development on Rikers was made by uh, people that we would call progressives. Um, and chief to understanding why they did what they did was their belief um, that they could build human cages in New York City that were capable of solving the social problems that are quarantined in jails. Poverty, homelessness, mental illness, substance dependency, right? All of the problems that you see um, very obviously manifesting themselves if you've ever set foot in a carceral facility, um, the, the, Humanists of the post-war period really believed that they could solve these problems in the jails. Um, and their assessment of the city jail system in the 1950s, and this was led by Anna Cross, who I think we're gonna talk about in a minute, was that they simply needed more capacity. They needed newer facilities, better facilities. And if you're paying attention to the news in New York City today, this bullshit is back right, um, with much less of a historical alibi than it had 70 years ago. Um, and they, they argued that we just need more infrastructure, we need more development. Um, and chief among um, these infrastructure projects was the creation of a bridge to Rikers Island. And if you'll permit me, I wanna say a word about that. So prior to the mid 1960s, Rikers Island was only accessible by a ferry. Um, the Department of Correction had a small fleet of ferries, and it was not possible to have anything like the population of detainees that you have on Rikers Island today. In fact, the only facilities um, prior to the bridge opening up were uh, sentence facilities, meaning you, got, you just got sent there and you stayed there, right, until you went home, right? It wouldn't have made any practical sense to ferry people back and forth to court like they do today. Um, and it was very important to the reform commissioner of the Department of Correction in the 50s and 60s to construct a bridge to Rikers Island um, that connected Rikers to Queens. Um, this opened up the possibility um, to undertake considerable infrastructure expansion on Rikers. And it was done so specifically as a reform effort. The mayor at the time called it a bridge of hope, right? 
And I found all kinds of maudlin writing at the time from the, the prisoner run newspaper at the penitentiary celebrating all the wonderful things that were gonna happen on Rikers now, now that this bridge was open. Um, then we know what actually happened, right? Um, this piece of infrastructure in, the, in, the, uh, in a far flung corner of New York City, it's, you know, it's, it's next to LaGuardia Airport. So if you've ever flown into there, you've probably seen Rikers without even realizing it. This, this small piece of infrastructure suddenly became um, the easiest, most desirable, most convenient place um, to build large numbers of human cages in New York City. Um, and while the, um, the reformers who built the bridge had the best of intentions, right? Um, the, um, the people who came next, right? And this is when the law and order movement really kicks in a high gear. And then you got folks like Koch taking over the city, right? Um, they, they were only interested in the island as it could cage large numbers of people um, far away from the streets of New York. And the reformers who had built this infrastructure were not in control anymore of how it was used. So that in effect, um, and this is simplifying a lot, the, the, the physical plants, the, the bridge, the, the jails, uh, effectively took the city hostage. Um, in a, and, and at the same time, um, these, these pieces of infrastructure were emblematic of the broader political shift toward the power of police, um, toward the finance sector, um, and various attributes of the post-war, uh, post-crisis uh, political constellation in New York um, that I think we're gonna talk about in a minute. And one final note, um, and I, I apologize for going on so long about this. Um, as you, as you asked, the cover is actually, um, this is a group of prisoners who had taken over um, the penitentiary in 1975, and they're reading their demands um, to the press. And I, I, this was a really important moment because it was at the time when the, the New York City fiscal crisis um, was really bearing down on working class New Yorkers, um, specifically in communities of color. And um, the, the jails were possibly the most miserable places of all. Um, and there were a number of, um, of rebellions and escapes um, to contest this awful situation that um, the city had thrown a lot of people into. Nice, thank you so much for that. I just wanna say, you know, for folks that are viewing this, listening in, um, I think something, two things I really love about the book, Jared. First is it's really easily accessible right? Um, it's, a, it's a social history that is really a page turner. There's so many political actors involved. There's so many interests. Um, so I really appreciate like the, almost like the beat and the pulse that it's written in. Um, and then secondly, I really appreciate and I hope we get to draw out this a little bit more in the next half hour, um, how Rikers Island, um, you know, it, the book is about Rikers Island, right? But it's about these larger set of social economic political transformations that New York is undergoing, right? Um, and I think, you know, those two for me are kind of like really important parts of, of the book and things I took away from. Um, and again, I'm gonna ask a few questions and then we're gonna open it up to Q and A. So, you know, feel free uh, to drop questions in the chat as well. We're, we're you know, we're really um, excited to hear from folks that are viewing this as well. And, you know, again, this is a really important issue. Um, and I kind of want to come back to Anna Cross, right, because I think today you made this really important point that we're back at it again, right, in terms of the conversations around closing Rikers Island that the new mayor has obviously balked on, right, um, and, um, but there's still some steam about replacing Rikers with this, with this, this series of neighborhood-based jails that would be seen as a reform effort, right, uh, it would be a way for people to not have to take that that bus into Rikers Island to have to go through that process, right? So there's a way in which the neighborhood jails get sold uh, to especially black um, and uh, Latino working class communities in New York City, right? Um, so I wanna kind of return a little bit to the figure of Anna Cross, just for a minute or so, if you could, um, you talked a little bit about her, if you could just draw, you know, she's kind of this important um, reformer in this, you know, in this, in the 1950s, right, she builds this bridge, she's really, uh, she's really trying to, you know, she's really trying to build Rikers into this particular 
model of rehabilitation, right? So what are the challenges she hits against and how are they emblematic of kind of the larger shifts that are happening in New York City at this time? That's a great question. Um, I just got a text from my mom with, a, with a, a, a quote about Cross from the book and said, I love this woman, keep reading. Um, it's a little bit more complicated as the story goes on. But actually Cross was a very interesting character. Um, she was very much a creature of the progressive era. Um, Cross was a pioneer of um, various progressive courts in New York City, including family court and juvenile court, um, and was very much what we would call today um, a penal welfareist, right? Meaning this idea that uh, punishment procedure should be um, uh, soldered onto some kind of rehabilitative uh, clinical approach to what Cross called human engineering. Um, and she was also what we would today call um, a carceral humanist, meaning um, she had all kinds of plans for how uh, jails and other human cages could be repurposed to uh, serve the broader, the, the greater good. Um, and so I would actually became enamored of Cross um, and I, I traveled to her archive. I think Captives might be the most, um, most comprehensive biography of Cross um, in print, though I might get an angry email about that claim. Um, and I found that she was very much emblematic of a spirit that we still see today. Um, and like I said earlier today, there was this event at Columbia University about how to make a feminist jail, right? This Cross would have been there if she was alive, right? Um, and so Cross represented the, um, the good hearted, you know, left wing of capital um, in its efforts to exert parochial control over the New York City working class in a moment of great social transformation. Um, the post-war period was very disordered. Very disordered. Um, it was a time when great profits, um, you know, uh, flooded the coffers of cities like New York um, at the same time as the migrations um, of African Americans from the South and uh, Latinos from, from Puerto Rico changed the racial composition of the city. Um, and it was just a moment of you know, great crisis for which the, you know, the 1960s have become emblematic. And, and Cross really believed that even as, this, um, as the, the, the great um, you know, violent social transformations intensified, that um, jails, prisons could be agents of social good. And to this effect, she designed considerable infrastructure, laying the foundation for Rikers Island, quite literally through the, not just the bridge, but a number of carceral facilities. And, you know, I mean, this, um, it's one of the sad ironies that, you know, today on Rikers, probably the last place that you want to get locked up is a real badass jail called the Anna M. Cross Center. And it's really like hers. It's really the one thing that people actually know about Cross on Rikers these days. Wow, insane. Um, so I kind of to, to go back to uh, the set of transformations, um, I really appreciated how really, I think starting from chapter eight onwards, you get kind of these major transformations in the city, right? You detail the Harlem riots, the changing uh, demographic, demographic composition of New York City, um, also the changing economic landscape, right? Um, a lot of the social services, uh, you know, kind of like these almost like New Deal programs that were, that were experimented in New York, right? Kind of being one of the model cities for the New Deal po uh, yeah. era policies, kind of start uh, unraveling Right, uh, we see a lot of transformations. Um, and so I wanna talk about that, but I think in the context of how that relates to the rise of the law, law and order, right? Like how is it that we go from the, uh, the, like kind of this liberal reform mindset to the, the rise of uh, the NYPD, of the correctional officer unions as political figures. And I think this is really important, Jared, because um, you know, again, like, I mean, it's gonna be tooting your horn this whole time, but I think something I, the third thing I appreciate about your book is that I think when we read uh, social histories of prisons, 
right? Uh, a lot of them are focused on kind of the day-to-day -day life of what it's like to be incarcerated or uh, the day-to-day -day drudgery of work as a correctional officer. And something I really appreciate about your book is that it kind of allows us to see that these are not, it's not just about individual police officers or individual guards. These are actually powerful organizations that didn't always exist this way, right? That came to be this way, that amassed a, a lot of power and had exerted important uh, it, and exert a lot of uh, exert a lot of influence over city politics, right? So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the rise of you know uh, the correctional officer unions and uh, the NYPD and that how that's an important part of the his, the social history of Rikers too. I'm really glad you brought that up because if there's one thing that I want you know people to take away from this book is the argument that police departments correction departments, they are not amalgamations of individuals. Uh, most of the reform proposals that you find, whether it be the, you know, police have to take, you know, sensitivity training or learn about their implicit biases, or there's this really nebulous idea uh, pushed by Michael Jacobson and others about how the Department of Correction needs quote unquote culture change, right? Once the word culture starts getting thrown around, you know you're in the ethers of mystification, right? Um, these are not um, amalgamations of individual people. They are coherent political blocks. The NYPD, uh, COBA, um, you know, the PBA, right? These are, these are coherent political actors. And I learned this not, not through reading about it in books, but through living in New York City, through doing activism, through witnessing, um, you know, in 2014, how Mayor de Blasio um, effectively had to bend over backwards apologizing to the police union um, for the offense of saying that he had cautioned his black son against, um, you know, potentially deadly encounters with the police. And that, that whole, um, that in, entire sequence of events around, um, Black Lives Matter and the post-Ferguson rebellion in New York really opened my eyes to how powerful um, these political blocks are. Um, and the more I learned about the history, right, and specifically the history of COBA, the more that I saw that this has been going on for a long time. These are organized political blocks, right? Um, and why you, you can make the cops do sensitivity training and you can teach them about pronouns and all the rest of it, but they're always going to do what is in their political interest as an organized political force, the same as you or me would do, right? Um, and so, you know, this led me to something else that you mentioned, which is that it hasn't always been this way. Um, these, these have not always been uh, powerful political players in New York City. Um, and I, I talk a little about in the book, you know, and I, just let, me, let me just say right now, if you, if you try to read this book, it's a bit like a serial drama or like a Russian novel or something. Just get through the first, you know, 20% of it. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of characters. There's a lot of set pieces. I swear it's all going somewhere. Um, once, once the 60s kick off, it's, you're, you're off to the races. Uh, but, but so I do, I do a little bit of work in the beginning um, laying the foundation uh, for how city unions were solidified um, as legal bargaining uh, agents in the 1950s um, and how they came to move from what were effectively uh, lobbying institutions um, to um, powerful political um, actors in their own right, capable of taking on the mayor uh, directly um, in the public arena and behind the scenes and actually winning. Um, and key to, um, Key to this analysis are two components that I think are central uh, to understanding the book. Um, the first is that the movement of law and order in New York City was very much a rank and file movement. This was not something that was pushed on to cops and guards by George Wallace or Richard Nixon or anybody like that, although they certainly benefited from these high profile politicians espousing right wing politics the same way that Trump or people like Trump today benefit from the support of cops, but they were organizing 
they were organizing on the grassroots level against the um, the gains of the Warren Court, against um, the procedural law revolution, against civil rights. They were pushing back against the encroachment on their autonomy that all of these um, social trends represented. Um, and they did so through direct action, through sick outs, through strikes, through, uh, through pickets, um, and a lot of things that we, that we associate with kind of the left wing of the union movement. Turns out they can do it too. Um, and the second part I think um, is equally important. Uh, they found uh, a powerful ally in um, the, a large segment of New York City's ruling class who did not want to pay for a large public sector anymore. Um, especially as the great society dollars began to dry up um, and the, um, the profits of the post-war boom began to diminish. And so historically, we're talking about the early 1970s, late 1960s. Um, the New York City's coffers weren't quite so swollen anymore, right? There had been considerable white flight, uh, loss of um, whatever manufacturing could, uh, could be said to remain. Um, and New York was simply not as, as prosperous as it had been in terms of tax revenue, um, but the, the expenses for the programs that had been developed in the previous two decades, um, which disproportionately benefited black and brown New Yorkers, um, were still on the books, right? And um, you know the New York City's ruling class just didn't wanna pay for it anymore. They, um, and so I, I think we're, we'll, we'll talk about when this kind of comes to a head around the fiscal crisis, but I really just wanted to emphasize those two components, right? This was a movement from below, um, and it was able to successfully dovetail, dovetail with the organization of the, the big bourgeoisie. And I mean, if you really want, if, if this sounds really abstract to you, all you need to do is look at the relationship between Trump, Trumpism, and um, local, the local kind of small scale capitalists, local cops, right? And then the, the, the big fish, right? The big finance elites who profited a lot from all the deregulation and all the rest of it. There can be symbiotic relationships between these actors on the local and national scale. And it doesn't mean that one is, is simply driving. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important distinction. Um, and I think it's, it's also to like to recognize that um, I really like the way that you highlighted the ways in which the law and order movement was not a top down, right? I think it's essentially that's how, um, you know, it's taught about, right? Or we learn about it, right? So like Nixon or Reagan, right? Kind of these uh, politicians came out with their politics and people rallied behind, right? Um, and I think it's important to kind of recognize these grassroots efforts of how um, how policing and correctional officer unions amassed this power. So I wanted to go back to the fiscal crisis, right? Or actually to just the law and order movement and maybe the fiscal crisis. And I think something I appreciate also about your book is that, you know, as it, you know, um, any New Yorker, right, would associate a lot of the law and order politics, a lot, you know, in terms of like, when we look at broken windows or kind of these policing practices, right? would associate them with the Giuliani era, right? In many ways, Giuliani became like a symbol of the law and order politics um, in New York in the 90s. Um, and I think something that your book does such a good job at, uh, besides showing how police are these political actors who organized, and it was a rank and file movement, it traces that law and order movement a lot earlier, right? So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that um, and then, you know, its relationship to the fiscal crisis in a way, and maybe, I, and I think you're so great at this uh, to distill it for us, right? And, you know, how can we understand uh, the two coming together? Sure, and so the, the fiscal crisis was, um, was a watershed moment in New York history, and this is certainly not my analysis. Um, this is, I, I benefited a lot actually from the scholarship of, of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, and specifically an excellent article on the history of um, the jail guard unions um, by a scholar named Rebecca Hill, who wrote about this very topic, this, the, the, the pivotal role that guards um, and cops played in the restructuring of New York during the fiscal crisis. 
Um, and so I think it's important to emphasize that for a, for a little while in the early days of municipal unions in New York, I don't know how much of this is folklore, but it seems like they were all kind of in it together, right? There was there were there were a lot of profits pouring in, right? Um, and no union was willing to step out and basically say fuck the rest of these unions. We demand you know ten percent more, so on and so forth. They have um, they used what's unfortunately known as Me Too clauses, which meant something different, um, to basically argue that. Um, whatever one union was able to bargain for, the other city unions were entitled to. Uh, and this had the effect of allowing the most powerful uh, unions like the transit workers and the sanitation workers um, to, uh, to pull along the, 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 the least powerful, right? So you could, you know, not every union had the power that the sanitation workers had of letting the trash pile up, right? Um, just that is an amazing power that New York City, especially uh, the transit workers have, um, right? So not every not every union had that kind of power, but the city the city unions were were willing to to work together and to bargain comparable contracts. Um, in the in the once the fiscal crisis uh, kicked into high gear, the um, the the cops and the guards were. They had been pushing against this for for some years, basically saying we this, the same shit they say today. Oh, we do the most dangerous job. We're like the most important workers, right? Look at Bureau of Labor Statistics, right? Uh, what's the most dangerous job in America? Top ten. You're not going to see either of them, right? But they've created this folklore that they're that they do the most dangerous jobs. So they've been saying this for some years. But when the fiscal crisis kicked into high gear, they really um, they ratcheted up this message, saying you can cut anybody else. Right, we don't care. Right, cut. You know, we you don't need you don't need teachers. You don't need parks. You don't need any of this. What you do need is cops, and you need guards. Um, and this represented a very powerful realignment of social spending priorities um, away from um, you know, this kind of what what we could call welfare state spend spending. Um, you know, and there's a lot of critiques to be made of the the way that public housing and education and all the rest of it, you know, reproduce income inequality, right, in working class communities. But you can see by looking at what happened in the aftermath of the fiscal crisis that their abrupt withdrawal was disastrous, um, especially given that these are sectors where um, overt discrimination in hiring was a lot more difficult than in the private sector. And coupled with a lot of the gains of the civil rights movement in the previous decade, um, the public sector um, employment in, in New York City had provided um, upward mobility for a lot of working class people of color. Um, and so there were dramatic cuts um, that disproportionately targeted um, black and Spanish surnamed people. Yeah, um, and this was a moment when the, the cops and the guards said in no uncertain terms, we can take it from here, right? You don't have to fund these massive Keynesian projects anymore. Um, you know, all we need to run society is basically a club and the free uh, reign to use it, right? So just, just let us take it from here. Um, and, you know, you know the, I talk about a lot in the book how um, the, the restructuring of New York City's uh, political economy in the aftermath of the fiscal crisis is really what led to the hothouse expansion of Rikers Island carceral capacity. Um, in the 1980s, as the city jails and the police absorbed all of the symptoms of the social crisis that had been caused by the dramatic realignment of, uh, of public spending, public employment, and social power. Nice. Great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go to some of the questions from our audience, and then I could always loop back to some of I have so many questions. <laughs> we could be here all night, but I want to give folks a chance uh, to ask theirs. So here I have uh, from someone. Thank you for your work, Jared. I was curious if in your research on Rikers, if you have encountered intersections with the planned shrinkage discourse of Roger Starr that had a significant role in municipal policy in New York at around the same time that the Rikers population was significantly expanding. 
Did organizers or militants draw a connection between the growth in cages to plan shrinkage in poor neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color? I think I know who might have asked that one. Um, <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a great question. You know, I didn't find any explicit evocation of that term, but I mean, as, as you know, you didn't need to in, uh, invoke the term at the time to, you know, to communicate what it represented. And I think Rikers was very much um, the result of this, this effort at planned shrinkage. And you saw the, um, the neighborhoods that were hit the hardest by the, um, by the uh, divestment of, um, of city funds, public services, public employment and social power in the aftermath of the fiscal crisis came to be the neighborhoods that were most dramatically represented um, on Rikers Island. And I think the best demonstration of that um, comes from the allocation of funds to the Department of Correction for its capital budget in the 1980s um, at a time when just about every public agency in New York, except for the, the, the cops and the teachers who were big supporters of Koch, that's a different event. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sidebar that one. Um, except for the teachers and the cops, just about every city agency um, was in shambles and they were just trying to hold on to whatever they could as they were basically you know, taken apart. Um, and the DOC's capital budget expanded 3000% um, in the 80s under Koch. It was, it's amazing. The, 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 the workforce of guards um, did something like doubled um, and it really set the table for, by the time you get to the mid 1990s under Giuliani, who as Jana points out is often, you know, kind of falsely uh, credited with, you know, starting all these trends. You know, he certainly didn't do anything to reverse them. Um, by the time you get to the 1990s, um, Rikers is, you know, has the capacity to house, you know, upwards of like 22,000 people, right? I mean, this is this is a demonst This is a, a pra the practice of planned shrinkage, right? It's just allowing communities to literally fall apart, right? Places like in, like the Bronx, right? It's like South Bronx, literally just fall apart, um, while um, there um, you know lar large numbers of largely working class men, you know, um, are carted away to this truly terrible, just just horrifying place um, where where violence and you know, brute force were the order of the day. Uh, yeah, I can, I can think of no better demonstration of planned shrinkage in practice than kind of how, how the Rikers shook out in the 80s. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think today, um, part of what's interesting that has happened is like, you know, people say, oh, the Bronx is not the same that it was in the 80s, you know, when like, it was like so disinvested from where, you know, it really looked like, you know, bombed out. I mean, certain places look like, you know, they were completely bombed out, right? Um, I mean, you know, I guess uh, something to talk about too is like the role of a lot of like the ways that nonprofits have emerged as key actors to manage that poverty, right? In city life, um, in cities across the United States, not just New York, right? But New York being a key example of that, that have like kept things afloat, right? But I, I would say that that disinvestment continues today, right? Um, and it's no, it's no coincidence that um, it's the, the neighborhoods that are most disinvested from, as you mentioned, Jared, are the ones that are fueling the po populations inside Rikers. And I would say that that's kind of goes beyond New York, right? Chicago, where we live, you look at who is uh, in Cook County Jail, right? It's folks from, um, you know, from literally the five neighborhoods that have been historically also disinvested from for decades, right? So it's kind of, I, I think it's interesting in that way to see that as much as there are so many particularities to Rikers Island and to uh, to New York City political life, right? Um, and the choices that, that led us to where we are today, we kind of see this across major cities, right? Um, and I think, uh, I kind of want to go back and I think the question that John Proctor asks gets us at this. Uh, you talk about in the eighties, how, you know, um, under Koch, the COBA undergoes this like major expansion 
And I think what ends up happening too is that it's also creating jobs for a lot of Black and Latino working class people who for the first time are also going to see a pathway to the middle class. Um, you know, I remember when I was doing my own research, like you go to the Department of Probation or even Rikers Island, right? Like the guards are black and brown. Department of Correct, I mean, the Department of Probation, when I was talking to people, there was only one white officer. They were all black and brown, right? So John Proctor asks what I think is also a really important question. First saying, I'm really looking forward to reading your book, particularly the history of the development of COBA. Something I run up against when criticizing officer union is the difficult reality that they have maintained so many tropes of systemic racism while now having a majority membership of black and brown people. So uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on this conundrum. It's a great question. And I, I saw recently that the new president of COBA has fallen in love with identity politics um, and is now baiting um, critics of COBA saying that you are attacking a, um, you know, a majority people of color working class organization, right? If I, if I play my cards right sooner or later, they'll probably say that about this book. Um, I think it's, it's a very sad and unfortunate reality that um, the restructuring of New York City in the aftermath of the fiscal crisis foreclosed um, a lot of um, opportunities for upward mobility um, for uh, black and brown working class people at the exact moment that they were being opened up. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was part of the broader transformation of the American labor force um, attendant to deindustrialization. Um, and so you had, you had this situation arise where um, actually if you're in New York City and you, um, you were come from a highly segregated working class community of color. Um, and you, you know, unlike a lot of, you know, middle class, uh, you know, young people, you don't, you don't have, you know, five or 10 years to like screw around and find yourself and major in poetry or whatever. You got to like support your family. Um, you might, I mean, you're probably supporting your parents. You might, you might have children of your own by that point. Um, right. Uh, the quickest way to um, financial security um, is uh, often through um, employment in either uh, the Department of Correction or the NYPD. Um, and because those agencies are always looking for quote unquote diversity, um, there's, there's a very clear path. Um, and not to mention the pensions. I, something I think a lot about in New York City, if you're a working class kid and you're trying to get a pension, and benefits and like retire, right? I mean, like city jobs um, and kind of these two jobs are really do offer that security in ways that no other employment um, in New York offers. Yeah, and it's like, it's almost a cliche that like, if you ask, if you ask like a hundred um, like kids what they wanna be when they grow up, nobody's gonna say CEO, right? Um, it's a job that people fall into for, purely economic reasons. And, you know, I've learned in my capacity as a, as a, a so-called criminal justice professor, I've been surprised that I haven't even found very much ideological affinity with the job, um, especially among the young people who plan to go into it. Now, as we know, social being determines consciousness. So if I track them down in 10, 20 years, they'd probably want to tell me about all these right-wing politics. But for the time being, um, they have what we might consider a progressive view of all kinds of social questions. They just know that the most important social question is how they're going to support themselves and their family. Um, and it can be achieved um, through employment in this, you know, um, this particular sector. I think what you need to look for with COBA um, is, um, I think, and this is something that I emphasize a lot in the book, um, what, what are their primary demands? Um, and I've, I found that, you know, there's COVID did a lot for its membership over the years. Um, it's now being a, being a CEO is now one of the better jobs, um, in the New York city public sector. If you could set aside what you actually have to do all day, which I understand is pretty miserable. Um, but one of the main demands that COBA has consistently advanced um, over the last 40 years is 
the freedom to dispose of prisoners with as much violence as guards see fit. Um, it is their main political issue, and it has been for a very long time. They, they want civilian oversight out of the jails. They want to relax any and all um, disciplinary restraints on guards meeting out violence. Um, they don't want anybody to know about violent incidents involving prisoners because they don't even want there to be any kind of real disciplinary procedure for addressing it, let alone um, publicizing it, right, or uh, uh, attacking it on a systemic level. And so, I mean, if, if you step aside from the demographic breakdown of COBA, right, or thinking about guards as individual people with different varying degrees of compassion and intelligence and all the rest of it, and if you look at them as a con as a concrete political block, and so I said this earlier, I'm gonna say, like, look at them. They're a coherent political block. They have a, they have a, a few very very basic issues that they have been pushing with a remarkable degree of consistency for decades. Um, and this their interests place them in direct antithesis to the dignity and safety of um, the the working class people of color who represent the, the vast majority of um, the, um, the New York City jail system. So um, I understand that COBRA gets, plays, the, plays the identity politics game, but it's, it sounds like it's not your first rodeo, right? Don't fall for it, right? If their, their demands place them, again, in direct anti antithesis to the, the, the dignity and safety of, um, of working class people of color in the city's jails and by extension their, their families and loved ones. Um, and there's no way around that. And it, it brings me, um, thank you, Jared, um, and for John for asking that wonderful question. It gets me to also the end of your book. Uh, you end the book with um, this, this, um, this block, this rebellion essentially, um, where guards block the entrance to Rikers Island so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you decided to end with that um, as an event and what, yeah, what were you trying to relay to readers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's, where the, that's where the story ends. And then uh, there's an epilogue that bridges the 90s um, to, the, to the present, the yeah. recent present. <laughs> the present changed a few times while I was writing this. Um, it's really hard to keep up. Um, so the story begins in the mid 1950s with Anna Cross taking over the Department of Correction and wagering that uh, human cages can be repurposed as agents of social good. And chief among this, chief uh, uh, in this strategy is the idea that we can replace so-called custodians, which was the term at the time for guards, meaning the guards who simply use violence to ferry prisoners you know, back and forth from their cells and so forth, that the so-called custodians could be replaced with effectively social workers and clinicians. This was, a, this was a distinctly progressive era idea that you could replace the, the violent um, actors who, you know, simply move people around using compulsion, like, like cops and guards, um, that you could replace them with clinicians, with experts, with, you know, steeped in the social sciences and all the rest, of it, right? Um, so Cross really believed that over time, uh, she could affect what, what we might call a withering away of the custodial force. Um, and that as the power of the, uh, the civilian side of the Department of Correction grew, um, and as Cross brought more and more, um, you know, the elite educated, you know, um, experts into the fold. And as she built partnerships with, you know, New York University, with CUNY, um, and with, with a number of nonprofit institutions who we haven't talked about just yet, right? Cross really believed that um, the Rikers of 2022 would be run by the civilian experts and it would look like you know, these Norwegian jails that everybody loves to imagine that we could replicate in the United States or something like that. She really believed that. Um, and, I, and the reason why I, I chose to end um, in uh, 1990 is that this was, a, was one of the most militant labor actions in 
the New York City public sector uh, that I can think of, at least at least in the uh, the mid to late twentieth century. Um, it was remarkable. Um, I mean, if you, if you don't know the story, I'm not just saying this to sell books, you have to read it. Um, it's the, the guards uh, blocked the bridge, the one point of entry to Rikers Island um, with a number of demands, all of which were almost immediately met except for the one which was the, the freedom to dispose of the prisoners however they saw fit without um, the restrictions of use of force protocol. Um, use of force protocol governing their, you know, uh, civilian oversight over the guards using violence against prisoners. Um, you know, if you know anything about uh, New York City Department of Correction, use of force protocol is often just about as uh, worth about as much as the paper that's written on because they do whatever they want anyway. But this was a very important issue um, as, as it remains today. The problem was that the use of force protocol that was in place was mandated by a federal judge, right, um, who had been um, overseeing litigation in, um, against the Department of Correction for the better part of two decades, um, and who had finally had to step in actually and take very um, aggressive action to try to bring the Department of Correction um, into sync with the, uh, what he understood to be the, the barest minimum, the barest minimum of Eighth Amendment uh, constitutional conditions. And I think that this is actually a really interesting case study for people in the present who say that what Rikers Island needs is federal receivership, uh, because something not completely unlike the federal receivership happened in the 80s with this with this federal judge. Um, and Jared, that was actually um, one of the, Q the questions from our audience. Um, if you could address the current federal receivership uh, on the one hand, it's dangerous to root for the feds to rip up a union contract, but if ever a union needed to be overhauled, it's COBA. And this is from Ted Ham. That's a great question, Ted, and thanks for coming. I, I can't see the question, sorry. Um, so yeah, the, the, okay, so that brings you to federal, the, the, so in, in the 80s, um, the, federal, the federal judiciary had DOC by the short hairs and it actually led to the most militant action that the guards have ever undertaken. They blocked the bridge um, for multiple days. It was a very violent scene, actually. The city the, later downplayed how violent it was. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of evidence that an EMT was stabbed by the guards. Um, there was a big brawl, actually. It's, it's almost like it's like a, it's like a Chester Himes story, like the the, the, the EMTs are trying to cross the bridge and the guards won't let them. And so they pull the guards pull these two EMTs out of an ambulance and beat them up, but not before one of them gets on the gets on the intercom and says, send more EMTs. So then a squadron of ambulances show up and all the EMTs get out and they start brawling with the guards. Um, supposedly one of the EMTs gets stabbed. Meanwhile, the cops um, are, are kind of nervously fingering their firearms, but the guards all have guns too. It almost turned into a shootout. Um, and, you know, I can't even tell, I can't even do the story justice for the amount of time we have left, but it turned into a massive staff riot in which, um, you know, a large number of guards ran, uh, ran wild through one of the major jails on Rikers, just wantonly brutalizing prisoners, stealing their possession, like just actually robbing them um, and just, and creating, you know, hundreds of very serious injuries. Um, and so this was, this was the way that the, that, that COBA uh, the, and the COBA rank and file responded to federal receivership or, 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 or an earlier version of federal receivership, right? Uh, which was ba basically a, a federally mandated use of force policy. And, um, and the, the feds backed off. Um, they're, they're very powerful. And I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say this as, to say that nothing, oh, nothing's possible, right? They're too powerful. But like, I would, it seems like the, the federal invasion of Rikers Island would have, would be as likely to have a galvanizing effect on the guards um, as, as it would um, diffuse their power, right? And again, I don't, I, I, I'm not a psychic. I don't, I don't want to throw cold water on the ideas of people who are trying to ameliorate human suffering. 
um, but there is there is a precedent for this, right? And what the what the incursion of of uh, the federal judiciary did in the '80s was really um, it it um, radicalized the guards and and led to basically their decisive victory over oversight by civilians. Nice, thank you, and thank you for that historical insight too into kind of understanding the moment that you know what can unfold i we don't have a lot of time left we have about five minutes left and i know this is like a big question to end with but i think it's an important question um and i was just wondering if you could just give one or two things and you know this is such a great book again i encourage everyone to pick up a copy um it's it reads fast it's it's really wonderful there's so much uh history that's packed into it um i've learned so much and it's been really nice to kind of read the book in its entirety having known Jared for, um, and having known how you have worked on this project and, you know, had worked on different pieces of it and all to, to kind of read it all together um, is really wonderful. But I guess the question I wanted to end with is, you know, thinking of this book, uh, your, you know, your research, your activism, what are one or two things um, that you think are the main takeaways for, in terms of the implications that this book has for how we understand uh, mass incarceration today, right? Um, the ways in which there's so much attention now that's being drawn to the social ills of, that we know of um, prisons and jails. What are like one or two things that you would want your readers uh, to know that you feel like this book has implications for? Thanks, Shauna. Um, and you're, you are being modest. We've actually worked on a number of um, related projects together. Um, and so I think that you've you've been a big part of this project, and like I said, it's really just awesome to be able to 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 share this event with you. Um, Thank you. The main, I mean, the main takeaway that that I would really push is that the left wing of the ruling class cannot save us, and will not save us, and doesn't want to fucking save us. Um, and this includes the the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, any number of left talking Democrats, you know, um, whoever might be, you know, uh, posturing in support of, you know, um, decarceration in Washington, D.C. these days, right? I mean, there's a, there's an argument to be made, you know, and abolitionists make it for, you know, strategic alliances with individual, you know, bourgeois politicians to get X, Y, and Z so-called non-reformist reform passed. I'm, I'm increasingly skeptical that, that, that that's even possible. Um, but what I, what I do know is that these people are not going to save us. And why would they? They represent the social order that has given us mass incarceration. Um, I just, I, it, it, it kind of, um, it boggles the mind to, to, to think that, you know, these, these multi-million dollar nonprofits um, or these bourgeois politicians would do anything to fundamentally alter the class structure of American society, which is ultimately what uh, mass incarceration is about. It's a particularly violent and nasty expression of the racialized class structure that has characterized American society since its colonial period. Um, and so, I mean, the, the only solution is, um, is the, a mass movement from below that sweeps these people away and makes them irrelevant. Um, and otherwise we can just, you know, we can expect to repeat the, the sad farce um, that I chronicle in this book over and over and over again with new, uh, new faces playing the same roles. And, you know, like I said, there was this event today at Columbia University. It's like the criminal justice reform lab or something. Something has lab in the title. That's a big red flag. Um, they want to make you into a guinea pig. That's what that's what that means. Um, but so it's like the same the same thing over and over again. It's just going to keep happening, wouldn't it? And the the only real solution is just a is is a mass upsurge from below. That, that yeah, that again just just sweeps all these people aside and makes them irrelevant. Nice. I think that's a really fantastic ending, and I hope. Uh, people pick up this book to kind of learn the history, to learn these mistakes so that we don't repeat them. Um, and I think, you know, um, a, there's a lot in the book um, to, you know, to learn from and to understand this current moment 
when the territory has gone a little bit murky, right? And those lines are sometimes difficult to discern. Yes, yeah. couldn't agree more. Um, thank you both so much for this really wonderful, insightful conversation. Um, <laughs> this history really is our present and has such major implications for the future of civic life here in New York and the future of mass incarceration nationally. So thanks again for sharing it with us today. Um, those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of Captives from Community Bookstore or your favorite local indie. If you're in Chicago, maybe Pilsen Community Books or Women and Children First. And we hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank you. And Thank Jared, you. congrats again. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> All right, take care. Thank you.